Good evening. I'm Tim Davis, a hand surgeon at Nottingham, and I've been asked to talk on ulnar nerve entrapments in the upper limb by the Derby hand surgeons. The most common ulnar nerve entrapment in the upper limb is at the elbow, cubital tunnel syndrome, but it can also occur at the wrist within Guillaume's canal, but this is much rarer. I was told, once told that of 20 ulnar nerve entrapments in the upper limb, 19 would be at the elbow and one at the wrist in Guillaume's canal, but I personally think that's an overestimate of the number you will see at the wrist in comparison to the elbow. The presentation of an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow goes in a standard way. Mild cases will present with intermittent sensory symptoms. As the compression of the nerve gets more severe, the patient may complain of permanent wooliness of the ulnar innervated fingers or, total, or increased loss of sensation over time. And in the more severe cases, there will be permanent wooliness or loss of sensation in the fingers with an associated motor deficit. And with a very severe case, there will be total loss of sensation in the ulnar nerve distribution and wasting and total paralysis of the ulnar innervated intrinsic muscles. I would stress that I firmly believe that an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow never presents as a pure motor deficit. It always starts as a sensory, uh, with sensory symptoms or sensory and motor combined, but never purely um, as a motor deficit. And if you see someone who appears to have a pure ulnar nerve motor neuropathy, think of other causes such as compression at Guillaume's canal, which can cause this, but doesn't always, also think of thoracic outlet syndrome or neurological conditions like motor neuron disease, which will often cause fasciculation of the forearm muscles if you look carefully. The sensory loss in an ulnar nerve uh, le lesion at the elbow affects the ring and little fingers and the ulnar board of the hand, both on its palmar and also on its dorsal surfaces. The motor weakness, if present, will affect the ulnar innervated intrinsic muscles and also the flexor digitorum profundus uh, muscle and to the little finger. I used to, it will also affect the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle, but I have difficulty assessing this while the flexor digitorum profundus to the little finger strength can be tested by asking the patient to grip an object firmly and then you try and passively, forcibly extend the little finger distal interphalangeal joint and see how easily or difficult, it, or, or difficult it is to forcibly extend it. You can then compare it with the force needed to forcibly, passively extend the index finger distal interphalangeal joint while the patient is gripping the object firmly or compare it with the little finger on the other side. And it is important to see if there is reduced sensation on the, uh, on the dorsal aspect of the hand, and also if there is weakness of the FTP of the little finger, as those will only occur in an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow and will not be present with an ulnar nerve entrapment at the wrist. So it distinguishes between entrapments at those two levels. So should you do, when investigating an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, perform neurophysiology to confirm where the lesion is and whether it is an ulnar nerve entrapment. I used to advise this in all cases, but over time have become less strict with myself in ordering neurophysiology preoperatively. The reasons for doing it in all cases is because other conditions can mimic an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, 
such as thoracic outlet syndrome or entrapment at the wrist. And also the surgery is not always successful and having preoperative nerve conduction studies can be useful in, in, in assessing failed cases to see what changes have occurred in the neurophysiology of, uh, as a result of, of the surgery. And I tend to be more selective of it of, in the, my use of neurophysiology, but still use it quite a bit. I always think in a case, what would I do if the nerve conduction studies came back normal? Well, if this was a case where there was a classic history of intermittent numbness and tingling in the ring and little fingers with a positive Tinell's test at the elbow and everything pointed to an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, I would probably go on with the surgery. And so in that case, preoperatively, I probably wouldn't involve, uh, order nerve conduction studies. And I also think, what would you do if they came back abnormal? And this is mainly a plea not to do nerve conduction studies as a fishing exercise to try and find a cause of odd clinical symptoms for which there is no obvious reason. Because if they come back abnormal, the temptation is to say, oh, everything is due to an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow. But that may not be the case. This may be a false positive nerve conduction studies and probably is if the clinical symptoms do not fit with those of an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, which is classical symptoms. And in my opinion, if you can get a good history, never appears in an atypical form. The causes of ulnar nerve compression at the elbow are quite numerous, but the vast majority of cases are primary due to a thickened arcuate ligament. This is a ligament joining the two heads of the flexocarpial naris, the one from the medial epicondyle and the one from the olecranon process. It is otherwise called Osborne's ligament, named after a Liverpudlian surgeon who described this uh, ligament and its compression of the ulnar nerve. And if you look at it, this is a, uh, just a diagram. You've got the ulnar nerve running down here, and here you've got the flexocarpial nervous. It's two heads, and usually there's a triangle of, of, uh, in, the, if, in the FCU here, just distal to the arcuate ligament in the middle muscle. But this gray thing is the arcuate ligament, and it serves as an insertion for some of the flexocarpial naris muscle, uh, an origin for some of the flexocarpial naris. And that can thicken and become tight and is ex essentially the roof of the cubital tunnel, while the joint, elbow joint, is the floor of it and can be affected in condition and uh, cause problems if you've got an osteoarthritic condition. So there's an arcuate ligament, uh, I think is a normal one, though I'm decompressing this ulnar nerve. I'd have to confess that I'm not convinced that I got the diagnosis right here. And if you look, you can see up here the muscles of the epicondylar head of flexocarpial nervous here. And here they are of the olecranon process. And just between them, there's this sort of triangle. It's often a bit longer than that and thinner, where you can see uh, where there is no muscle attachment. And you can usually see further down uh, the difference between the two, the muscle, muscles origin from, originating from two. And straight under that, in my experience, is almost always the ulnar nerve. And that's a good place to find it. If, uh, uh, and where I always actually find the ulnar nerve under the and then when I'm doing these surgeries. But it can occur secondary ulnar nerve compressions. Cubitus valgus, where you've got a, a valgus elbow, you think the ulnar nerve is having to run round a long circumference so that uh, it could be stretched. And that may be a different pathology to the, the compression of the arcuate ligament, but it's stretched in cubitus valgus rather than compressed. Uh, it can be secondary to elbow osteoarthritis if you get osteophytes forming in the floor of the cubital tunnel or a synovitis in rheumatoid arthritis. And then it can be associated with nerve subluxation and dislocation where the ulnar nerve slips 
the medial epicondyle uh, when flexing an extension of the elbow. But many people have these nerve switch sublux with no symptoms at all. And finally, it can be due to external pressure, as Carlos and I were discussing just earlier. If you knock uh, the uh, medial aspect of your elbow, dorsomedial medial aspect, you can uh, bruise the ulnar nerve, causing tingling and numbness. And the common cause when I started off, and I don't, can't recall when I've last seen one, was uh, injuries occurring to the ulnar nerve in patients anesthetized on the operating table because they, their elbow, arms are rested on their chest with their elbows resting on the sides of the operating table where there are off, off, often attachments to allow you to attach a side table made of metal and the elbow hasn't been adequately uh, padded to protect from pressure, uh, the extrinsic pressure from the operating table on the elbow. And as the patient, normally that would hurt and cause numbness and tingling, so the person would move and relieve the pressure, but if you're anesthetized, you don't. And I saw quite a few complete ulnar nerve palsies as a consequence of that. And my opinion was that uh, the prognosis for them was very poor whether or not to operate, but I couldn't really see the logic of operating as, as soon as your patient comes off the operating table, the compression has gone. But I did in some cases operate and it didn't seem to make any difference. Just a slide, I'm hoping I can sell this to you as a ganglion arising out of the uh, medial side of the elbow, which I attribute this compression of this ulnar nerve, uh, which I've I'm uh, put out of retracting with the McDonald uh, too. And so you should always look at the floor of the, when you're doing surgery, of the cubital tunnel and see if there's anything there as well. And then you've got these rare causes. Uh, and this, these are listed, the medial head of triceps or arcade of struthers. And I can tell you with confidence, having looked it up this afternoon, that the arcade of struggles is a ligamentous band which runs from the medial head of triceps to the intermuscular septum uh, in the upper arm and the ulnar nerve can be trapped around it. The ligament of struthers, that does for the median nerve, the arcade does for the ulnar nerve. And I can't confess to ever having convincingly seen one uh, or recognized it during surgery. And this other is this anconius epitrochlearis, which is an abnormal insertion of the anconius muscle. So it runs over the cubital tunnel and is thought to compress it. Uh, I've never, never knowing, I've never attributed a compression to that, but I have seen anconius muscles overlying the uh, cubital tunnel. And that most certainly is divided uh, just to, to get at the cubital tunnel. So. If it is a problem, I've always addressed it, but thought attributed, not attributed the enconius muscle to the problem here with the ulnar nerve. So possible surgical treatments. Uh, well, before putting that in, there is non-operative treatment and people do give, uh, get prescribed night splints particularly to wear to stop you bending up your elbow and hugging the pillow at night. Uh, I don't use them. Um, I have in the past, and I haven't had much success. I hope there are no therapists out there. If so, I apologize, and I may be totally wrong. And also, patients don't seem to like them. So I'm not a great advocate of non-operative treatment, though if somebody's got recent onset of symptoms, I'd certainly give them a time to see if they settle before uh, considering surgery, just to see if they settle spontaneously. And then you've got uh, the operating uh, operations, which you've uh, just all voted on. Simple decompression, which is basically release of the arcuate ligament and having a good look around the cubital tunnel, which can be done open or endoscopically. Uh, anterior transposition, subcutaneous or submuscular. And then medial epicondylectomy, which is not very popular, but it's something I've used quite a bit in the past, preferring it to transposition, but I've gone off it now. Simple decompression, I think is <coughs> suitable and all you need to do in almost all cases. I think it's, you should consider it may well be unsuitable if you've got cubitus valgus and there I'd be more tempted 
uh, to do an anterior transposition subcutaneous. <laughs> and also, if you've got a subluxing symptomatic nerve, I just worry that if you've got a subluxing nerve, it's coming out from under the medial epicondyle when you bend your elbow, so that it's more likely you're going to lean on it and irritate the nerve after surgery, well, well, before and after surgery, and that may be part of the problem. So I'd be tempted again to consider a, uh, a transposition there. But I can't remember when I last saw a sim subluxing symptomatic nerve. Sorry, I'm about to cough. <coughs> my technique, and this is my technique, and it may be it may all be hokum and there's no need to do that, but it requires a small longitudinal incision compared to an anterior decompression. And I always mark out the wound or where I think the wound should be before making it with the elbow fully straight and draw a line where I think the incision should be, which is exactly in the longitudinal line of the arm, straight down the arm. And my th theory is that is that that's the incision which is least likely to uh, be crossed by a sub of which could form a tendon neuroma. The problem is that is when you bend the elbow up, the incision moves forward and you find that the incision is in the wrong place. And I then draw another line parallel, which is now curved because the elbow is flexed, parallel to that and use that in my incision. So my aim is to make sure the incision is absolutely parallel, uh, long, parallel to the uh, axis of the arm uh, in the hope that that's going to reduce the risk of subcutaneous nerve damage and problems with that. As I mentioned earlier, I usually expose the ulna and the, ex the flexor carpi ulnaris distally first, <coughs> find the ulna nerve under it, and then release the cubital tunnel all the way along from distal to proximal. That requires division of the arcuate ligament, and I look carefully at it to see if it is thick and if what the underlying nerve looks like. Uh, and if you find the underlying nerve is thickened, having been squashed by the arcuate ligament, that suggests that that's almost certainly a neuroma in continuity, where basically the arcuate ligament is prevent, has prevented, because it's so tight, has prevented ne after nerve, de nerve axis axon death, new nerves have tried to grow out so the dip proximal to the arcuate ligament. So neurofibrils have been sent out, but they can't pass under the arcuate ligament. So you get this thickening of a neuroma in continuity. And that's worth recording and I think affects the prognosis for the outcome of the ulnar nerve. <coughs> and as I say, I inspect carefully the floor of the cubital tunnel, having reflected the ulnar nerve as little as possible to see it. And sometimes you see reflections of the capsule which seem to be sticking out uh, into the cubital tunnel and I will release those to sort of give a flattened surface but I don't know whether it's necessary or not, I do it and if there are osteophytes or ganglia I remove them. But that's usually, it's a, those are patients with osteoarthritic elbows usually quite obviously beforehand. So after a simple decompression the recovery time of the ulnar nerve. Well, I think the intermittent symptoms should go rapidly. Maybe not as rapidly as in the carpal tunnel release, but they should go quickly within a matter of days or weeks. The permanent numbness and tingling, and this goes for any operation, the recovery of that will be slow. And if you assume that the, the problem is uh, basically uh, the compression at the elbow has caused nerve axon death, yeah. so that the nerve axons have died back to the arcuate ligament and the elbow, then by axonotomesis they got to grow back up to the finger to cause sensation or the intrinsic muscles. That's a good 40 centimeters, that's 400 millimeters, and if axonotomesis occurs one millimeter a day, that's going to take one and a half years and may not occur. But I think it can, it can recover and the interesting thing is that in some cases the permanent numbness goes within 
I've seen in one or two months, which doesn't fit for a neuropraxia and doesn't fit for an axonotomesis uh, and lies somewhere between. And I've seen that quite often, but not all of them recover at all. And I think much can be is dependent on and can be predicted by what the nerve looks at, like at the time of surgery. If it looks healthy, the outcome I think is more likely to be good than if it looks sick. Does intrinsic muscle wasting and weakness go? I think it's often permanent, but the trouble is very few people have ever done a two-year or three-year follow-up of patients with severe ulnar nerve uh, uh, entrapments at the elbow following release to actually see how much recovers given time. So simple decompression, uh, that's the sort of incision I use. And you can move the incision up and down so you can get all around uh, the uh, uh, the cubital tunnel and release it fully. And uh, there you are. Well, this one I'd be highly suspicious of, and I'm sure I was, that uh, that this wasn't an element at the elbow. So maybe I should have done nerve conduction studies if I didn't. But there you release it and the ulnar looks fine underneath. And then I'd explore all the way. You can move the scar up and explore all the way up there. And then I tend to put a McDonald or whatever down to check there doesn't seem to be any compression distally and more important uh, proximally to feel that the nerve is free throughout. And that's all I would do. Uh, well, I would actually, and I still do, I flex the elbow fully up to see if the ulnar nerve, nerve looks particularly tight. One flexion, it normally doesn't look too bad, but if it does in the past, I've been tempted to do a medial epicondylectomy. Complications. The complications which I've run into with an, uh, 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 of two types, those at the side where you're left with a tender scar, which is probably due to superficial damage, or you, there's a tender neuroma of a superficial nerve at the operation site. Occasionally, you can get numbness and tingling in the distribution of the medial cutaneous nerve of forearm due to damage on that. Uh, tend not to see any ner superficial nerves when I do this surgery now. Uh, it's, my eyesight's still pretty good. And I think when these do occur, it may be from traction on the retractor, which in that last slide you saw, was, there was quite a lot of that, but that was so that you could all see what was going on. And then you've got problems with persistent numbness and tingling in the ulnar nerve territory. And that could be due to the wrong diagnosis and incomplete relief ulnar nerve which is incapable of recovering which I haven't added there uh, and that's worth thinking about uh, I mean you should know if you've done an incomplete release and, and you should know what the ulnar nerve looked like at the time of surgery so always think about wrong diagnosis and think out the box. In comparison an anterior transposition is a large incision well I think it should be a large incision because I don't want to kink the nerve uh, and if you read it, I think textbooks, I think they go 10 centimeters above and 10 centimeters to the epicondyle. And I always think there's quite a risk of doing cutaneous nerve damage in that. No, sorry, it's eight, six, six centimeters above. Uh, okay, I don't know what's happened. And then you, having done that, you've got to mobilize the ulnar nerve over a long distance and that requires according to Green's operative hand surgery dividing the medial intermuscular septum but do preserve its vascular mesentery. The, the blood supply to the ulnar nerve is that it has a very mesentery in which blood vessels come to it and then blood vessels run a fed, fed from these uh, mesenteric vessels run along the artery but the, the, the supply is to a large degree reliant uh, on the mesenteric vessels. And if you divide them uh, uh, over a distance, you, you may get an area of infarction of the ulnar nerve, giving you loss of function. And I think the outcome of that is pretty poor in the cases I've seen covered. And if you're doing your so, uh, trans anterior transposition, you can do it subcutaneously and place the nerve in front of or above the epicondyle and you can do that creating a fascial sling between the muscle and the skin 
or suturing, people have just sutured the subcutaneous fat to the deep fascia to hold it up. I'm worried that isn't good enough. And also, and what I tend to do is create a sling uh, and pass around it. Now, if you look at the muscle coming off the medial epicondyle up, up here, they've all got a, a fascia, fairly thick fascia aponeurotic outer layer which goes further than the white bits here it goes right up into the into the forearm and you can get create quite a long slip of this flash if flash if you elevate it off the muscle underneath it right back to its insertion and then having done your simple decompression some people could just move the ulnar nerve place it under this fascial flap which you've uh, created and suture the flap back where it, it was but that moves it quite a long way forward. And I prefer just to pass this flap under and around uh, the ulnar nerve so that the ulnar nerve comes up a, a bit and then suture the sling to hold it at, uh, so that it holds it above the medial epicondyle uh, and, uh, and check that uh, and leave it at that, checking it's a very, I don't do the sling tightly so that the nerve can glide up and down. And that's what I've done on few occasions when I do an anterior transposition. The submuscular is a far more aggressive procedure where it requires you to divide the complex origin, elevate the fluxor muscles off the capsule and place the nerve on the joint capsule before reattaching the muscles to the common flexor origin. So you start like that and basically you cut across there uh, mobilize everything, put the ulnar nerve under the flexor muscles and then suture it back. And that seems to me overkill. I've never done it myself. I've seen it done. And I, I think a fascial sling is a far more gentle procedure and is the one which I prefer if I do this. But I would stress that I think at least 95% of my ulnar nerve decompressions are a simple decompression, no more than that. And again, that needs a long incision. And I, I can imagine that takes quite a time to recover from uh, and get a comfortable arm. And doing these transpositions, this uh, you are damage, risking the circulation to the ulnar nerve. And this is just showing the forearm is down on the right side, the upper arm the, the shoulder is up top left. And there's flexor carpi ulnar is, is origin in this specimen. It's not one I operated on earlier. And this is the medial epicondyle. And you see these vessels are in a little, very thin mesentery, come out to the ulnar nerve. And then the blood vessels run up and down it. And as I say, if you cut those off, these longitudinal vessels may be insufficient to maintain circulation throughout the length of the ulna. So maybe you'd get an infarction here of the uh, nerve, which presumably would heal by fibrosis and therefore make it uh, make regeneration uh, very difficult, impossible uh, with the neurofibrils not being unable to get through the infarcted area. So I'm very wary of moving the arm, elbow to uh, the ulnar nerve too much. And I think you move it less with my uh, with the you creating a sling and doing a, a subcutaneous transposition. So medial epicondylectomy. Well, I used to do some of these. I've gone off them. You do a simple decompression first. And then when I used to do it, it was when I used to bend the elbow up and see if the, el if the ulnar nerve looked as if it was going to sublux or if it looked very tight. And if it did, I'd do a medial epicondylectomy. But it's not taking the whole lot off. All you want to do is remove a little bit so that the nerve can glide anteriorly with elbow flexion. So it's taking off what I call the posterior medial lip of the epicondyle. It's a slither of bone. And that just allow, when it flexes, stop, allows the nerve to glide anteriorly. It doesn't look so tight and it makes me feel happier. And I always at the end put bone wax on the raw bone in the hope of stopping bleeding. 
but the fact of the matter is if you do this, the elbow is sore over the medial epicondyle and it's sore to lean on for quite a few months. And in retrospect, I wonder if doing this and letting the nerve glide anteriorly but not transposing it completely means you're more like than likely to lean on the elbow if you lean uh, lean on the nerve when you lean on your elbow and put it at greater risk of irritation but i haven't had people complaining of that but it it does worry me a lot worries me so what i just explained it there we are here's our specimen there's the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle and when you flex the elbow up if it looks squashed and tight or subluxed that's when i do a medial epicondylectomy and what I'd be doing is uh, just taking off something like that, even not really, not necessarily that much, just so that when you follow, the nerve can move up a bit. In fact, I wouldn't take that much off. You don't need to. But I've really virtually stopped doing that now. But it did seem a solution, but I don't know if it, there was a problem for which the solution was required. And they may just have done as well with simple decompressions. Results. Well, there have been some randomized control studies. My name's on one, but I wouldn't hold any of them uh, to be uh, to create a knockout blow to show anything is more successful than anything else. And my personal view is the results are the same uh, outcome to, are the same apart from the, the complications. And the bigger the operation you do, the more likely complications. And I think the submuscular transposition is most likely going to cause the most local problems. I don't think any is as reliable as a carpal tunnel release because the ludic tend to get more symptoms, more patients, I think, complaining of persistent symptoms at the elder. But lately I haven't had, I've had been on quite a good run uh, in Nottingham with that. But it is, and if it does, if you, there is numbness, it takes longer to recover than after a carpal tunnel relief. But the intermittent symptoms, if you got the diagnosis, should resolve. And the constant numbness, weakness, and wasting, that very much depends on the state of the nerve. So if you believe this was ever an ulnar nerve entrapment, this is the one I showed you with the very thin arcuate ligament, the nerve looks good. So any constant symptoms associated with that uh, should resolve. It felt soft if you palpated it and it wasn't tight. Here's another one. Uh, so I didn't take a photo before releasing it. This is the, the forearms up to your right, the upper arms up top left, medial epicondyle. Uh, that's the epicondyle ahead of the flexor carpi ulnaris. There's the uh, olecranon head. And this diagram, that's gray, is supposed to be arcuate ligament before it's been divided. And look how thick the ulnar nerve is proximally. And when you've released the arcuate ligament, Look how thin it is just distal to it. I mean, you can't deny that it was a compression by the arcuate ligament. Now this, as I say, I think is a neuroma in continuity. And you wonder if that nerve is ever going to get its act together to send a reasonable amount of axons back down the ulnar nerve. And I would be saying that this nerve has a very poor prognosis for recovery, however good the surgery you've done. And as I say, if they are going to recover, it's going to take an awful long time. But I think in a nerve like this, the prognosis is very poor. So complications, simple decompression, superficial neuroma are the main worry for me. If these are complications of the surgery rather than recovery of the ulnar nerve, medial epicondyle, superficial neuromas and tender epicondyle. But that usually goes, but it takes a few months. Anterior transposition, neuroma, damage to the medial cutaneous nerve of forearm. I don't know, I can't prove it's got a higher incidence than with the other surgeries, but you are doing a bigger injury. And then devascularization of the ulnar nerve. Now that is rare, but if it is, it's devastating as I do think it gives a, a loss of function and pain and, 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 co and may cause, persist, cause permanent pain as well uh, in the few I've seen. Uh, Fortunately, none of mine, uh, but that steered me very, to only use anterior position very rarely. So it's far more interesting, ulnar nerve entrapment at the wrist in Guillaume's canal. 
it's an uh, interesting area the anatomy and this is one I did earlier this is there's the thumb top right this is the little the thena, uh, hypothena eminence and the little finger out here and here we've exposed the Guillaume's canal and released it and the pisiform bones sitting in there and the hook of the hamates there and if you look here you got the ulnar nerve proper there then it divides and you've got your sensory branch and then you've got your deep branch which is your motor branch which goes deep and around the hook of the hamate and it often goes it, it goes through a tight not a tight canal with a very sharp edged aponeurosis fibrous aponeurosis often as it digs deep and then you've got the nerve to abductor digiti minimi coming off before that as well and all sorts of things and the presentation will depend on where the nerve is compressed in Guillaume's canal uh, and what it's compressing. So basically if it's in the first part of Guillaume's canal where the ulnar nerve hasn't really hasn't divided you'll get sensory and motor symptoms but you get others where it's distal or medial which only affect uh, the common uh, the sensory branch uh, which can just cause sensory symptoms but if it uh, but you can also get compression purely of the motor branch and that's the one I've mainly seen uh, where you get intrinsic wasting uh, but interestingly the hypothena muscles uh, the adduct minimi is spared so you get you get obvious wasting of the first dorsal interosseous on the ulna board on the radial board of the hand but uh, the hypothena muscles look pretty good and it's quite interesting seeing the different uh, types and working out what the problem is. The most common cause I think is a space occupying lesion and it's most often a ganglion but can be lipoma. I've seen a pigmented villa nodular synovitis causing it. Uh, you have other rarities, a hamate fracture, an ulnar artery aneurysm there. And I've actually explored one or two where I just think it's been a type of the uh, compressions of the deep branch where I didn't find any pathology like a lipoma an aneurysm or anything but it just seemed the deep nerve was tented over a very tight uh, fibrous aponeurosis where it passed down and under and around the, uh, the hook of the hamate and then you can get extrinsic compressions uh, ext cycling leaning on your handlebars if you do it for a long time and uh, for some reason don't feel pain, you can get numbness uh, and, and numbness and weakness of your, you can get a, compre a failure of the on the nerve in Guillaume's canal. And uh, I saw a ne my next door neighbor managed to give himself one by going to a golfing range and spending a lot of time there hitting golf balls. They do occur, but my experience is that they, res they resolve spontaneously with time. But do remember that if you see what you think is it could be an ulnar nerve entrapment at the uh, elb, uh, at the at the at the wrist, say you've got what you think is a deep branch, you say you've got a pure motor uh, intrinsic palsy with normal FDP func flexor digitorum profundus muscles, so this is only the ulnar innervated intrinsics out. Remember that can be mimicked by a mononeuritis and is also not an uncommon presentation of motor neurone disease. And just look at the other side as uh, if it's, it may actually be symmetrical, which gives you a clue that it's a neurological condition rather than surgery. But, uh, but again, you can have a pure motor lesion, motor presentation of an in, uh, in Guillaume's canal of the ulnar nerve, which is not the case in my opinion, the elbow. So the diagnosis of it is basically the loss of sensation fits with there being a loss of sensation not on the dorsal aspect of the, fo of the hand but, the, on the fore, uh, but on the palmar aspect and that's because of the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve arising in the forearm. And then you've got a motor loss which is all the intrinsics, uh, all, all intrinsic, uh, no, no long flexors. Uh, the FTP is spared and the adductor digiti minimi may be spared but is not always spared. 
and there may be swelling. Uh, you may, on looking at the uh, at the Guillaume's Canal area, think that there's a swelling there if you look carefully. And MRIs or ultrasounds will define a lesion, a ganglion or other lesion if it is one there. Now here we got a case uh, and this is the hand affected and there's no hypothena wasting and I'm going to try and sell to you that that looks a bit swollen compared to that. And I assure you it did when I looked at it, but photographs never tell. And I think it's a bit more prominent. If you look at the hands uh, end up from the end on with the wrists extended, so you can see the hypothena eminences and compared them, there definitely seemed a fullness in this one. Believe me, I wouldn't tell a lie. Uh, so that's what I was looking at. And then you get an MRI scan and you show this lesion here and here, which was a lipoma confirming it so it was swollen. And if there is a space occupying lesion or well is it is an exploration of Guillaume's canal an excision of it though I have to confess that I've I saw one person with a ganglion uh, which was shown on ultrasound uh, causing one of these and for whatever reason his surgery got deferred and deferred and uh, when he came back uh, all his muscles had recovered, uh, presumably because the ganglion had gone away. So, but I wouldn't treat a ganglion expectantly. I would, I, uh, you, usually he just defaulted. Normally I would explore and excise the ganglion because the nerve is at risk. And I do this vision starting in the forearm, basically over the flexor carpi ulnaris running distally. And if you can do that, you do that, you will find the ulnar nerve just uh, me medial in, in, on the middle side of the and deep to the flexor carpi ulnaris and you can trace it distally and find everything without risk of damage. Uh, the landmarks more distally are the pisiform and the hook of the hamate for making your incision. And when we explored this case, here you can see there's the lipoma sitting there and if you look at the nerves the ulnar nerve itself that doesn't look too bad the sensory nerve which was unaffected in this case well it has been lifted up but it doesn't look stretched but the ulna, the deep branch here you can see is really having to go over and round uh, to get it under the hook of the hamate uh, whereas the nerve to adduct to minimi, okay, it's been lifted up, but it's not been tented as much. And that will explain all the anatomy. This was a pure, uh, all the clinical findings, this was a deep branch injury, uh, co compression sparing the abductor to minimi and the sensory branches. And when you excise it, it all looks a lot better. Nothing's under compression then. And I think if you look closely, there was a tight retinaculum here. And I think if you look there, I think the actually the ulnar nerve, the, the, the lipoma had pushed the deep branch onto this sharp edge here, as I think that nerve is just thickened, dis thickened where I put the arrow, I hope you can see it there compared to there. So I released the retinaculum as well. And I think this retinaculum uh, <coughs> can cause, prob may cause problems on its own if you get a negative exploration. That's just to show everything again. Yeah, I hope you'll buy that constriction. <coughs> the outcome depends on the state of the nerve, but I have to say the, the ones I've operated on have, have, have I think all recovered uh, because it's a short distance from the nerve compression to the end organs for the nerve fibers to regrow. And I think there's a far greater chance of recovery than for cubit uh, entrapment of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. And there's a quicker, quicker resolution of constant symptoms, which they, in my opinion, most of the symptoms with an entrapment in Guillaume's canal are constant. So conclusion, cubital tunnel is almost always constriction under the arcuate spelt correctly, ligament, otherwise known as Osborne's band, no surgical treatment superior to the others. Special circumstances may determine types of surgery, but that's really surgeon's opinion. And I've just given you my opinions. 
And other surgeons will say you never need to do an anterior transposition, even if you've got a cubitus valgus. And they may well be right. Uh, but I just feel happier uh, after the operation thinking I've done a good, uh, I've done what's necessary I do a transposition if it looks tight. Entrapment at the wrist, usually due to a ganglion, uh, and the, the treatment is decompression and excise the ganglion, and hopefully it won't recur. That was all I was going to say. It's a bit practical, this one, uh, but I hope that's useful. Thank you. <laughs>